Hey, how you doing, listeners? This is uh, Gina Versa. We're at a uh, special location today. We're doing on camera. Uh, we're at an office. Uh, I used to work here, the asylum. And we have a guest with us. He works here, Ryan Ebert. Ryan, how you doing? Doing great. Yeah, I've uh, known you for a while, so this is cool. Finally get to like have you on the podcast. Yeah, thrilled to be here. Yeah, be in your office, uh, talk about a movie that came out. Um, mm-hmm. We're interviewing on that. We're interviewing you on that. But uh, Ryan, before we get into that, can you tell us a little about yourself, like what you do here and everything? Uh, well, uh, I am a development assistant at the asylum, which means that I help in the process of making the scripts uh, go from uh, pitch to script. Uh, and then after that, it's out of my hands. But uh, every you know time somebody comes to us with, uh, hey, we would like to have this movie idea about a uh, sharks being in a tornado, we take it from there and we turn it into uh, what you hopefully see on screen. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I loved working here. This was a great place. Um, it's where all the, like, magic happens. Can you tell us a little bit about the asylum itself, like, uh, okay. yeah, as a, I guess, representative? Uh, so we are the, the B-movie people. Uh, yeah. We make 20 to 30 low-budget movies a year. Uh, that's our goal. And we make them very quickly uh we just kind of are a movie machine uh that just churns them out Mm -hmm. some of them bad some of them less bad Mm -hmm. uh all of them uh distinctly ours yeah Uh, there is a very asylum brand uh to our projects that is virtually unavoidable uh in just the process of how they are made but uh, that's part of the fun and the charm, yeah. and uh, we've definitely built an an audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a very vocal minority of people who are big Asylum fans and will watch everything that comes out. Yeah. And uh, you guys had a stacked panel at Comic Con this year. I was there. We uh, well, it, there wasn't a lot of competition uh, yeah. this particular year, but we had a. Uh, it was we were all very surprised with the turnout. Uh, it was the Sharknado 10-year anniversary, mm-hmm. and I had uh, nothing to do with any of the Sharknado yeah. stuff. That, yeah. was, that was before my time. Yeah. But uh, it was just a thrill to see. Yeah, the, we did a panel the year before that was uh, 25 Years of Asylum. Yeah, I was there, too. And That's where I got the shirt. The, and, uh, oh, I, you got that shirt, I got too? this at the, at the Pure Party. Oh, okay. Uh, but... Uh, so, we it wasn't as big a turnout for the 25th anniversary panel as we were hoping. Okay. And that's where we uh, debuted the trailer for uh, Shark Side of the Moon mm-hmm. and some other future Asylum uh, projects. Yeah. Uh, you wrote that as well? Shark I Side did. of the Moon? I yeah. co-wrote that with uh, Anna Rasmus and my wife. Nice. Uh, you watch it a, on Tubi. Tubi original. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was. They got a big room, and it was maybe half full, and that's looking at it uh, optimistically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when they, the opportunity came for a Sharknado ten year anniversary panel, uh, they didn't really know what to expect, especially with Comic Con the previous year not being so busy because of the pandemic and kind of coming back from that, and. They got a similarly sized room for the 10 year anniversary panel and the turnout blew us away. I was getting a little emotional Mm -hmm. at how many people turned out to be a part of the appreciation that is all things Sharknado Mm -hmm. and 10 years of it. Uh, And just because I know a lot of people who have worked extremely hard on those movies, my wife included. uh, And to see that enormous turnout was uh, was pretty special, and you were a part of it. You yeah, were, uh, I was you, there. You were there. You I were was there. One of the one of the thousand or so people mm-hmm. that showed up in that room. Yeah, no, it was it was a cool panel. It was also cool, like yeah, like ten years because you know when I worked here, like uh, I was probably like there when they were making five, like five, four or five, mm-hmm. and uh, just being around, like uh, the, you know, the, the the office and everything was really 
was really something special. And it was you could always tell when a Sharknado was happening because it was a lot busier, yeah, a lot more frantic, a lot yeah. going on. They'd uh, randomly be like, uh, I remember just like they randomly be like someone like. There was, like, a Tiffany... Oh, I forgot. It was, like... I forgot who it was. Uh, someone from, like, uh, the real... Not Real Housewives, but, like, a VH1 mm-hmm. show. They would just start randomly in the office and right. everything. Yeah. It's, like, do something. And, yeah. It was always interesting. Uh, I went... Uh, I was around... Really, from four on, I wasn't working here, but I was around. Because yeah. uh, Anna's been working here for over ten years. Uh, so I've been in the vicinity for some time. And wound up having the opportunity to be an extra, uh, kind of a featured extra in Sharknado 6. Oh, okay. Uh, time when they were stuff. going through time, I was uh, uh, allegedly Socrates. Socrates, uh, okay. It, just a real quick time travel, yeah. time NATO. Uh, you see a guy in a robe, that's me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... While we were there, they were also, they just had this, they rented out the studio and uh, just big old green screen. And uh, they just had a bunch of other things happening. They were just filming. Everyone who would come in be like, ah, get in that costume. Uh, you know, it was very frantic uh, energy. Yeah. And yeah, uh, right. some very famous people also came in to have some some brief cameos oh, on that day as well. It was like Neil deGrasse Tyson? Uh, he was not there that okay. day, but he was definitely uh, there. I think uh, Alaska... Thunder Fuck oh, was Thunder there. Fuck, yeah. Uh, can I swear? On this oh, one? yeah, you can definitely uh, okay. swear, yeah. Uh, You're good. Fuck, fuck, she, yeah. Was, she was around, uh, and uh, they were around, and they were uh, in, incredibly fun. And uh, uh, LaToya Jackson mm-hmm. uh, made an appearance, and it was, yeah. it was very, like... The energy was always kind of chaotic, and then yeah. everyone heard, like, LaToya's here, and then the energy just got very... It was very regal, and just, like... She had a pat, but she was very nice. But, yeah. Uh, it was just, it was kind of fun. It was always, whenever a Sharknado was happening, it was a very different energy. Mm. And uh, we missed that, but yeah, uh, it was it was a very good time. And then yeah. to see the appreciation at the panel mm-hmm. uh, was, was wonderful as well. Yeah, it was cool. Like being in the audience, there were like people that had like, like merch or like kind of like a pair, like random giveaway stuff from mm-hmm. like, 2016 um there was like people that had the hats that they were giving away for like the third one a lot of sharknado 3 merch was visible yeah people came prepared people were uh dressed as sharks Mm -hmm. uh running around those were not plants that we put in the audience those were real fans Mm -hmm. uh yeah it was a real treat because uh i I work pretty closely with the director of those uh anthony ferrante yeah he helps in development he's good he's uh he's been on this podcast like several times before yeah he's just he's a treat and a half but he was running around like a chicken with his head cut off that whole weekend just like frantically preparing anything and everything he could to make sure that it was a success and then for us to get there Mm -hmm. And hear that crowd, see that crowd and that energy in the room. People who were diehard fans who were excited about it. That was uh, it. Was it was a real treat? Yeah, it was cool. I was gonna say, and I never saw him like perform either. That was yeah. His uh, band we were all. That's uh, yeah. not his band. That was just oh, it's a, a band. Oh, okay. I thought that it was, was a local was uh, okay. San Diego band oh. uh, that they found and hired. They uh, uh, rehearsed once or twice before mm-hmm. uh and they we met up with them after uh after the panel and they were just delightful as well yeah. uh super fun group and yeah that whole uh that whole experience was just like truly uh you know i felt very much like a fly on the wall who was yeah. not really supposed to be there yeah. but uh it was it was a thrill to kind of see the people who had worked so hard on it get rewarded like that yeah. with uh with just the fans and, yeah. and the the love and it was it was great yeah that's what you do it for but yeah and then you guys are doing new stuff too i guess that's a segue into uh the movie we're here to talk about i saw a, i saw the screen a screener of it mm-hmm. just right now uh meth gator previously oh, yeah, meth gator yeah previously known as attack of the meth gator mm-hmm. but we uh we edited uh edited it down to yeah. meth gator yeah, so let's uh, let's talk let's talk about this. Uh, obviously, no spoilers because it hasn't come out yet yes. or anything. Um, but yeah, can you talk a little bit about like the uh, the genesis of this project? Because um, I, I you know I saw it. Um, I saw the announcement. I think I saw the tweet. Mm-hmm. I remember like co tweeting it. And I'm like, man, I miss uh, miss working on some of these movies. 
Well, that was also, that took us a little bit by surprise. Uh, so, the very beginning. Uh, Meth Gator was pitched uh, conceptually yeah. uh, by one of the co-founders, if, uh, if memory serves. It's, it started just before I started officially working here in development. Mm. Uh, but... He, uh, uh, David Ramawi, uh, was like, we're doing Meth Gator. Mm -hmm. And this was before there was a cocaine bear. So he just oh. got a tarot reading the night before and just uh -huh. knew that this was going to be happening. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people assumed that uh, we did this in response to cocaine bear and it was just a miraculous uh, accident. Mm -hmm. uh, but he came up with a pitch uh, and... We hired the writers and developed it, you know, from there. And, you know, the writers are authentically Floridians. Uh, mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, Meth Gator takes place in Florida. Florida, yeah. As, where it belongs. Yeah, where many gators there. Don't don't go in the water. If there's water, there's a gator in it. Yeah. That is just the number one rule of Florida. And uh, so they, you know, we worked on, on the script and making it as fun as possible while still being an authentic asylum movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was a joy to... That was one of the first movies I actually got to help develop uh, from the ground up. Because there, there were one or two before it, but that was, like, one of the first ones that... Here's the pitch. Let's get the one-pager started. Uh, let's, you know... I, I got some some input on that one from the ground up. And that mm -hmm. was, uh, it was... It was a lot of fun developing that script uh, from pitch all the way through and uh yeah i just i hope it winds up being as big a joy on the big screen as it is uh as it was on the page yeah yeah no because it's like um you know there's some really cool sequences in here i love the i love the gator um like conceptually i think like too it's um like a really cool unique idea because it's like uh i've never yeah i've been to florida like once but uh gators are like a thing like uh, I don't know, like, what attracts things to happen in Florida that are just, like... It's a magnet. Yeah. It's a magnet to chaos. Yeah, for some reason. But, yeah, um, yeah, no, it was, like, a great concept. And then just, uh, you guys also filmed in Florida, too. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit about that? Because, uh, yeah, it's on location, which it's is... It's on location in Florida. Yeah. Uh, the line producer found a small town that was game and was just excited to be a part of the process. Uh, and they were happy to volunteer. Uh, there's you know, police vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, fire department vehicles. Uh, the high school marching band showed up for a little while, which is just not something you can normally do on no. this kind of budget. But yeah. they were... Uh, they were just ready, willing, and able, and uh, it it really helps elevate this movie to a level that it should be. It's Meth Gator. Yeah. People are excited. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then kind of like going into this, do you guys, like, because this is kind of like, you know, like a monster movie, um, you know, like creature feature, um, the, you know, like developing this, and like, you know, you said like you film it on location. Uh, like, what, what are you, like... Uh, you know, because it's like, you know, we talk, I think we were talking about this before, just kind of like the, like, the juggle of, like, budget, time, and everything, mm -hmm. like, that goes into, like, making movies. Like, what was, like, the one of the most, like, important things um, to get across to you or, like, you know, the team in, like, making this movie? So the biggest thing is in a movie like Math Gator, the gator needs to be pretty omnipresent. Yeah. Uh, and we only get... 75 visual effects yeah. in in the script right. what ultimately winds up happening is they shoot a movie and sometimes more vfx show up mm -hmm. uh shoot movies in six days there's going to be some shots that you know we didn't have the prop we didn't have uh you know the set wasn't really clear so we got to get rid of coffee cups shout out to game of thrones mm -hmm. uh but that's the trickiest part to balance is making sure that this gator that is, you know, growing and on meth and angry <laughs> and violent yeah. uh, is present and it's felt and you, you know, eight, eight acts plus a 
teaser. So yeah. There's nine acts of a script, and you have less than ten VFX per act. Yeah, really, that's hard. Uh, it's a tricky balance because yeah. you you know you want it to be there, and also you know people might not realize this, but gunfire counts as a VFX shot. Yep, uh, and it's safer than you, using you, uh, blanks. Yes, yeah. Yeah. much safer. Uh, yeah. We are definitely things on asylum movies. Asylum sets happen very quickly, and there is no, there's nothing left to chance because it's, if a movie is shooting for millions of dollars over sixty days, uh, doesn't make their day, they have fifty nine days to make up for it. Yep. In a silent movie, we do about twenty five pages a day yep. over six days. Yeah, six uh, days. Six days. Yes. If you don't make your day, that means another day suffers tremendously. So, it's about making it as few locations as possible, uh, minim as few characters as possible, minimizing the amount of extracurricular stuff. Now. In this case, we didn't write in that there was a marching band there. Yeah. Uh, there was supposed to be some kind of a parade, but yeah. uh, that could have been, you know, we kind of figured that would be adjusted with uh, some aerial shots and some a couple of VFX just to set it up. But uh, they found one and they put one in. So, you know, it, it's all about trying to minimize the amount of requirements and then maximizing the things that you actually are able to get. Yeah. Uh, you know, as few sets as possible, as few characters, like I said. Yeah. Because uh, this is movie making on an extreme budget mm -hmm. in no time, and maxim and making it as big as a movie as Meth Gator can be. Yeah. Uh, so it's Agreed. really being very conscientious of every detail. Yeah. And hoping for the best once they get out there and start yeah. shooting. Yeah, it's like specific, like create, you know, constraints and everything. Yeah, it's like the fun of making movies, right? Oh, it's fun? Oh, like the uh, the fun of, like, you know, making a movie and making it happen, you know? Yeah. This, this is supposed to be fun? Yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it is it is a lot of fun to, especially now that I've been here for a little while, getting to, we're kind of isolated to our own departments for the most part mm -hmm. because it's just things move so fast and constantly. Yeah. Uh, so it's been nice in the past year to actually meet, like, some of the directors and line producers, mm -hmm. people that I would not normally know otherwise uh some of the editors and kind of working with them to you know hearing their because it all starts with development yeah it starts with a pitch and it goes from there and it will ultimately lead to it the vfx artists working on stuff and editors working on stuff and directors directing and line producers finding stuff so hearing you know hey we shot you know this movie uh you know, next time when it was actually really difficult for us to get uh, a house that required uh, large glass doors, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't really find one on our budget. So yeah. next time, you know, maybe don't be, maybe don't require that to be in the script for this movie to work. Yeah, uh, and it's like oh, okay, I would not as a writer have thought that would have been difficult, but this line producer whose whole job it is is to find stuff. Uh, found it extraordinarily difficult. Mm -hmm. So I will be mindful going forward that this might be a difficult thing. Or the opposite, if uh, you know, there was a movie I wrote called Apocalypse of Ice uh, in 2020 mm -hmm. that uh, the line producer was Anthony Ferrante oh, uh, yeah. and uh, directed by Maximilian Elfeld, who's uh, another delight. And uh, the scene was originally written to take place in a vet mm -hmm. office uh veterinary uh not veterans and they were looking around for something that might work for that and at the location they got for another thing there was a morgue that was just at this location uh so anthony came up to me and was like hey so we're having a bit of difficulty finding a veterinary office that'll work but we found this morgue. Do you think this scene could be rewritten? This whole sequence could be rewritten to take place in a morgue. This is like two weeks before we're shooting the movie. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I said, absolutely not. There's no way. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. This is just not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so when I started writing that sequence, uh, because they made it happen, uh, yeah. it wound up being probably the best sequence in the movie huh. uh, because they had this tangible location 
in person and you, you just that's part of the other thing with just making these low budget movies quickly is you have to be able to adapt on the fly to whatever is presented to you and if there's an opportunity like this morgue for example mm-hmm. uh you got to take it and reroute and it wound up they wound up making it work on the day and it was my favorite sequence in the whole movie yeah yeah no it's like yeah, it's like movie making you know it's just like some stuff you just have to change like practically or ends up just being in the movie uh were there any kind of like experiences that on that like where um you had to change things or anything without like spoiling anything Mm -hmm. for like meth gator or anything uh in meth gator um yeah there was a character uh anna beautifort for Mm -hmm. example uh the bartender and uh one of the people who goes after the townsfolk who goes after the meth gator uh, who's on the good team, they uh, were not written to have this intricate backstory that she winds up having, right. winds up having. but she, when they cast her, uh, she has a pretty uh, profound accent. Yeah. So that was kind of, you needed to kind of write a way around that because the guy they cast to be her dad had no sort of accent uh and that's just you know there's nothing you can do about casting that's just who they get and it's you know a day or two before the shooting when they're casting it so we had to adjust and rewrite kind of this backstory of how she was adopted by this guy and her dad used to it was this whole you know you'll see yeah uh but that was not in the script Mm -hmm. at all uh until days before they were shooting uh just to make it work uh, but most of Meth Gator was pretty, they pretty much were able to find most everything. The, uh, the line producer on that mini, she is, uh, she is a juggernaut. She yeah. is an absolute machine who can figure out just about anything. So if you, if she, there's certain, you know, line producers and people that you just, when you know they're on the job, you have you feel fewer worries. Yeah. Uh, and she's one of them and she got it done and, uh made it even bigger and better than it had any right to be for the time and budget given yeah i mean yeah that's why one of the reasons i love uh working here so many like talented people that just like make it happen in you know this amount of time there's like so many people that you know pass through here that are just great so yeah this is one of my larger uh annoyances and grievances with the public perception of the asylum Mm -hmm. the assumption is we're all just clueless have no idea how to make a movie and uh don't care yeah quite the opposite we are just in an abnormal pressure cooker yeah speaking of apocalypse device uh it's a fantastic example of this uh so we make movies for very low budget uh in no time at all and apocalypse device is is no exception yeah so if you go to the imdb right now Mm -hmm. of apocalypse device there is, for some reason, an estimated budget. Somebody, some rando, out in the universe, estimated a budget for this movie. Do you want to guess the number that they put down? Hmm, just off the top of my head. Uh, that they just put on, like, IMDb? Yeah. And where IMDb, you could just edit, anyone could yep. just edit anyone anything. Anyone could just edit. And it doesn't, doesn't accurately not a ton reflect. of fact-checking going yeah, on. Yeah, not a total lot. It's like Wikipedia, but worse. <laughs> Uh, two million, one million, one million dollars. One million, okay. And I can tell you with some authority, as the writer of that movie, yeah. Uh, maybe a tenth of that was the actual budget. Yeah. Uh, people just assume that every studio is on the same playing field. Yeah. Every studio has the same amount of time. Has the, I when uh, I had this issue with uh, some. Some random Twitter people uh, uh-huh. with Shark Side of the Moon. Yeah. They uh, were just like, man, this movie was such a great idea, but XYZ, uh, this was done poorly, this was uh, whatever, whatever. And uh, I may have responded. Yeah. Which, which I yeah. shouldn't do. No, yeah. But sometimes I, tweet. I, oh, no. I feel yeah. like I need to, 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 play, to, yeah. let, to give the information. Yeah, play uh, we're not and, so flat, really. and I, I informed them, hey, this uh, this movie was shot in nine days uh, for 
a lot less money than you think. Yeah. And uh, they're the immediate turnaround they had. They responded uh, with like, "Oh my God, this was this, this movie was shot in nine days. That's a miracle." <laughs> That you got this done in nine yeah, days. Yeah, it happens. So for every production. So it, yeah. every single production is an absolute miracle. And yeah. every single person. I've been on set. Uh, I was a production coordinator for a while. Uh, I have seen every step of this process from beginning to end. And when I tell you there are absolute genius miracle workers every single step of the way in post, in pre-production, mm-hmm. in actual production, the camera people... Just every single person on those sets, with rare exception, is producing a miracle. Uh, and it's always a little frustrating when yeah. you see people be so mean to them yeah. online. Yeah. Uh, but they don't know. Yeah, it's the internet. We do. Yeah. We know. Yeah. It's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard out there. In there, yeah. Yeah, work, work. Uh, you know, before you're like trying to like, I guess, be an expert on a movie, maybe like work on a movie or like right. read about movies, see, how right. they're made. Every really? like it, it's given me a new because I used to feel similarly about some things like how did this movie get made? Yeah. Uh, but now I'm just like every single feature length film that you see get made is its own little miracle. Yeah. And uh, there at least has to be an appreciation for the fact that okay, they started recording this movie mm-hmm. and they finished recording yeah. it. They edited it together mm-hmm. and put it out. And it's yeah, and it's out in the world. Like they they finish what they st- they a, started. A feature length film mm-hmm. that is a monumental feat. It uh, is yeah. a short film can be a monumental feat to anyone yeah. starting out there. Mm-hmm. But uh, to actually get cobbled together ninety minutes of even remotely coherent story is remarkable. Yes. And I applaud anyone who's ever done it because yeah. I've. I've seen even in the best case scenarios, uh, things go to shit pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, so to actually be able to make a movie is incredible, yeah. and I, I I applaud you for it. Yeah, I would, I would agree because yeah, some people don't even finish or they don't even do it. So, right. Yeah. It's we whenever we hire uh, we've hired some very green screenwriters mm-hmm. to work on these movies. We have you know writers from all over. We have writers who are. Uh, I've been professional for years and years and years, and we have writers writing their first movie. Yeah. I was one of the writers writing their first movie back Mm -hmm. in the day. And I tell them and remind them, uh, 95% of people who call themselves screenwriters have never written a script. Yeah. And even more of them have never written the end, at the end of a script. Yeah. They'll just start writing something and then never finish it. They'll be like, oh, I'm a screenwriter because I go to coffee shops and I own a Mac and I have a final draft and that makes me a screenwriter. It's an aesthetic. It doesn't. Uh, You have to have written a script to be a screenwriter. And Mm -hmm. just by doing so, even though you may not love the movie that you're writing, Mm because let's be honest, I've written a couple of movies that I'm not a huge fan of, not because of what it is. It's just I'm not a big, you know, I don't like earthquakes. I don't yeah. like earthquake movies. Yeah. I've never cared. I've written one. It was my first movie, yeah. San Andreas Megaquake. Yeah. Uh, we live in California, too, so it's like we have to experience the earthquakes, and it's, like, and, it's not fun. And I, yeah. I like an earthquake. You like uh, an earthquake? Knock on wood. I'm from Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, so so you we, never experienced it's just one. snow. Yeah. Uh, I kind of like, like, oh, that was an event. That, yeah. That felt like you something. Could, you could go on Twitter and just, like, tweet about it. The then... second I think I feel an earthquake, that's the first thing I do. <laughs> this is like, did I? Mm-hmm. And then Twitter will let me know. Yeah. Uh, yes, I did. See, this is why I hope Twitter, like... Stays around somehow. There's or just... some some unique joy <laughs> yeah, to being some in there. Cool. But uh, yeah. but yeah, I tell every screenwriter uh, who who starts with us like the fact that you have written a script that has been produced and made into a movie puts you so much further ahead than you might think because people mm-hmm. lose sight. You know, they're like, oh, it's just the asylum. Yeah, it's still the asylum. Yeah, like the, we're still. We, been making movies for 25 years with a certain level mm-hmm. of uh, keep talking success mm-hmm. uh, there are a lot of you know wildly successful companies that uh, have not been around a lot of studios that have not been around for yeah. 25 years yeah we are one of the few mm-hmm. uh, there is a you know a market 
for us. I like to tell people, uh, you know, when you're go when you go on to your favorite streaming service and you uh, are trying to find that movie you want to see, mm -hmm. and you got to scroll through about five or six uh, pages of movies that aren't that movie until you finally get it. Those are our movies. Yeah, that, that's all us. Well, it's like uh, on Pluto TV, you got a whole channel. We do have a whole channel. Whole channel streaming twenty four hours. I'm not trying to. Just you could plug that smooth plug in right there. Asylum channel, Pluto TV. Yeah. Watch it. Watch it now. Watch it forever. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do depend on that ad revenue, so oh, please, yeah. keep, please turn it on. Don't turn it off. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, every, every single person, every step of the way, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute miracle that any of these happen. And, uh, you know, even if it, it might feel like a minor success because it's not... Warner Brothers, Sony, yeah. Universal. Yeah. But a minor success in this industry is still pretty monumental. Yes. Just yeah. to have the credibility of written a feature that was produced mm -hmm. is is not insignificant and it's often not lost on people. And you will get yeah. people who will uh be like, Oh, it's just the asylum. But it's right. it's still professional it is still yeah. like a it's still, yeah it's still very real uh, yeah, exactly yeah it's like whatever dude like yeah it's like people like that you know yeah because it's like yeah this was uh one of my you know one of my favorite places to work and you know when i because this was probably like i think this was like the first company i worked for like out of college mm -hmm. and, you know and you know i work at other places in my day job and everything and yeah it gave me my start so I'll, I'll, i will always be grateful here, you know? We get a lot of people who start here or end here. It yeah. seems to be the uh, <laughs> people will have wildly successful careers and then kind of retire to doing asylum stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or they will be fresh out of college and get the job here and work here. And then that's a springboard into, because again, still professional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. wonder who that could be. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, we got yeah. a few. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, no, you know, uh, very well said. Yeah, and these are like movies that come out, and they're on Tubi. They're on like YouTube TV. I I, I can't name like all the streaming services and stuff that you could. We're like, on iTunes, oh, you a lot, Apple, yeah. Redbox. Uh, yeah, like everything. Every, just about yeah. everything. You can you can. <laughs> we have infected your favorite streaming service. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, for sure. We're back on Prime now. We were off for a little while. But yes. We figured it out. There we go. Until that Z Jeff Bezos like got to put us back on, yeah. yeah. But uh, going back to Meth Gator, like, uh, wh what were you like most excited about in like um, getting this like Meth Gator, like, uh, right? Because we were when we were watching, I'm like, I'm, like I was telling you, I'm like, I love the Meth Gator because it's like he has a lot of. Uh, it's a is it a he or it's a she? Or? It's up to you, man. Okay, there we go. All right, um, I'll just say it's uh, the Meth Gator. I'm like the Meth Gator, you know. Has a lot of personality, like those times where it's like animated, and you know the the visual VX, uh people here, like Glenn. Shout Glenn. out to the VFX department; mm -hmm. they made this movie sing. Glenn Campbell, great legend. Yeah, worked on. He was telling me he worked on Tron. That's awesome, Glenn. If you look at Glenn Campbell VFX artists uh, IMDb page, it is uh, a history of incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, card full. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'll just go to the. Okay. Audio, yeah. Uh, it is a uh, just incredible monument to Hollywood history. Mm -hmm. Especially, he was on Blade Runner. He was on uh, several Disney movies, uh, Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Mm -hmm. uh, the dude is legitimately a legend, and yeah. uh, he's worked his ass off here for some time. And uh, he has told me on multiple occasions, people who work in the industry at like on your present day Star Wars movies yeah. in you know the current Blade Runner movies uh, they look at what the Asylum does and are blown away by it Ooh. because essentially what we put on screen is just because of the time constraints and budget constraints that we have that's the rough draft version yeah. that is the first version that you're going to see uh, there's not really a lot of take twos Mm -hmm. uh, take threes are virtually unheard of. Yeah. So for when people who know what we go through uh, see what we accomplish given those parameters, they're blown away. Yeah. And yeah, the uh, the gator, you know, 
I uh, love how the Gator emotes. Um, you know, you're hi- hyping up the visual effects people because, yeah, they did a great job. And, um, yeah, no, um, I was saying it was kind of like a cat. It has, like, mm-hmm. a lot of personality and everything. Uh, there was yeah. so much discussion as to what this Gator could and could not do. Uh, even in the writing stages, uh, there was a lot of fighting back and forth with executives as to what a Gator on meth is capable of. Uh, and the gator in the script is significantly more tame than the greater you all, the gator you ultimately see because they realized like, oh, this is a gator on meth. We should probably be yeah. uh, making it a little bit more agile and mm-hmm. interesting than your typical uh, Florida gator. Yeah. Uh, so... I know that was a that was a big conversation that they had, and uh, you know the size of the gator. You can you know we said in the script it it gets you know from fifteen to twenty feet long, which is yeah. a long gator, but it's not an impossible gator. Yeah. Uh, and in the script, uh, you know that's what it was, but in the actual show, it's kind of dependent on where it's at and uh, the size it ultimately gets to. Uh, no spoilers. Mm-hmm. No spoilers. Uh, but it, if you know anything about Asylum movies... Yeah. Uh, it grows. It grows. It gets yeah. a bigger. Uh, you know, we can write whatever we want in the script, but it ultimately comes down to the reality of what VFX... What they shoot, because, you know, if, if we had some issues with, uh, you know, if you point a weapon here and the gator is on the ground on its belly over there and it's not supposed to be huge the now you have to make the gator in to make it work you got to yeah. re- reconfigure yeah, some yeah. things so it's kind of situational uh they 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 figured it out but uh they really did a a a fantastic job of finding a happy medium of not making this gator unrealistic mm-hmm. i mean it's it's meth gator it's, meth gator. it's unrealistic yeah. yeah but still within the realm of possibility mm-hmm. uh versus uh kind of unbelievable uh to the point where it's you're turning the turning away turning it off because it's yeah. it's too much yeah yeah no i mean yeah i think it came across you know really yeah it's like uh you know kind of fell in with uh, the rest of the like asylum creatures you know the sharks and sharknado the oh man i'm trying to remember the I'm trying to remember all the creatures the megal uh megalodon oh yeah we got megalodon yeah megalodon that's the last movie i wrote oh really megalodon the frenzy yeah check it out check it out there you go <laughs> but yeah no it's uh yeah it's it's really cool i i, I loved it yeah i was uh, i was enjoying just seeing it being shot kill killing people mm-hmm. Killing, killing meth dealers. There are it's, it's some a fun pretty creature. fun yeah. kills in this. Yeah, and without giving anything away. It's, yeah. uh, people die in Meth Gator. Yeah, that shouldn't be a spoiler. Yeah, it's Meth Gator. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, but it this was a kind of a rare example of a movie that the Asylum did where they did kind of follow the direction that was in the script as far as the kills are concerned. Mm-hmm. Because what happens more often than not is, you know, the writers will write something and then production will be, well, we can't do that uh, because we don't have uh, 40 stunt people and uh, rigs and cables and, you know, all the safety equipment that we would need. Uh, So they make kind of a version that's pretty close. Uh, But in Meth Gator, uh, I feel like they actually did overall a very good job on interpreting what was in the script and executing on that yeah so there are some still very fun kills that mm-hmm. uh make their way in and the vfx team absolutely delivers on some of that gore yeah uh that a movie like this absolutely needs it really does yeah and we're kind of like winding down here but uh can you talk a little bit about the cast and like uh just uh, some of the, like the crew because it's like you guys use like like uh you know, like uh, talent where they, you know, they uh, from like Florida and everything. Is that? Yeah, it was mostly uh, local uh, hires as far as cast, uh, which you know I thought they all uh, brought something unique and very Floridian to the. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
yeah, to did. the table. It what feels a, authentic. Yeah, it feels authentic. Like you're saying the writer is from Florida, or his wife is from Florida. Yeah, uh, the, uh, it was a team of writers, uh, okay. husband-wife duo, much mm-hmm. like Ann and I. Uh, and uh, there's, yeah, the writer is, uh, one of the writers is authentically Floridian, so yeah. they definitely Floridian. made sure to yeah. uh, bring that. That, that should in. be a term. Is that a term? It is a term. Is it? Okay. Yeah. I love uh, that word. You can, you can cut that out. No, no, uh, no. It's, it worked. Floridian. I love it. But, uh, but yeah, the, uh, the writing team definitely has a lot of Florida uh, knowledge that they put into the movie. Uh, and the only actor that I know for sure is not from Florida and a, and a local hire was the name actor uh, Patrick Laberteau, who plays the mayor. Mm-hmm. And I just want to give a big shout-out to him because uh, he's been in a couple of Asylum movies. Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's worked with us extensively in the past, and he's been working his entire career. And if I may say so, this could very well be his finest performance in Do a you... film. He's so fun and so authentic and grounded and good, and it really elevates this movie to a level that it might not have achieved otherwise. Yeah, uh, he was great. I I loved him as a mayor. He's yeah. an evil mayor. He's yeah. just so fun. Uh, it's fun to, you know, most asylum actors get roles that are, you know, mm. uh, I'm a scientist and right. I have to save the day or, yeah. you know, something like it's, I'm military and I have to save the day. Yeah. Uh, so to get a role like kind of mayor from Jaws, kind of an evil, but with a, mm-hmm. you know good intentions, but right. maybe not seeing the full picture here. Yeah. Uh, there's some there's some meat on its bones, mm-hmm. and uh, he really took it, ran with it, made it his own. And when you're you know, I didn't know Patrick at the time when they cast him, but when you are seeing the script happen, you kind of have certain voices, the characters in your head, and the voice that he has in the final cut of the movie uh, is exactly what I had pictured in my head when reading it seven, eight, nine, twenty times before. Mm -hmm. So perfect casting uh, and delivered on it, absolutely. And yeah, uh, yeah. shout out to Patrick Laberteau. Shout out to him. Yeah, because it's, uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, the uh, getting across, uh, you know, all the culture and stuff of Florida, because, like, Florida is, like, kind of, like, not trying to talk bad about Florida, like, uh, no friends there, but it's no, kind no. of, yeah. Talk bad about Florida. <laughs> um, but it's, like, it kind of is, like, its own country, because it's, like, uh, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if it's Florida, but there's a slap fight mm-hmm. in the movie, like. I don't know. Like, I never knew, like, what slap fights are, I but don't that's know a thing. if the slap fight is florida okay or not okay uh, but it does happen in florida i guess it, it is a thing that is real it does exist yeah uh, slap fighting exists mm-hmm. i promise you yeah uh, somewhere a, a, an executive uh saw some slap fighting somewhere and was like this has got to go in meth gator so we you know we can't say no they pay our bills <laughs> so uh we we put it in there mm-hmm. and uh i think it's one of the uh Excluding the the gator scenes, the gator scene, uh, it is uh, one of the more fun sequences in the movie. Yeah, uh, it was one that it's it's one of those where you write it in there, you question if it's even going to make the final cut of the movie. Yeah, because it's like you just you don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh-huh. But I think it turned out great. Yeah, and, and it's uh, it, and it's super fun. Yeah, it's making the final cut too. And it's definitely <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Yeah, you know, it's like I don't know. These are like uh, and also too like some of this stuff like I wouldn't see in any other movies like. In like an asylum movie, like there's just like unique, cool stuff. I don't know, like mm-hmm. slap fight, or like I don't know. There's like other other things and like other movies where I'm like, well, I was gonna say like uh, in your movie, Shark Side of the Moon. I don't think I've ever seen a uh, someone. Uh, was it like what's the Indian? It's like a baby shark. It's a human shark. Hybrid. Human shark hybrid, and it's like the chick's pregnant with it. Like mm-hmm. where would I see that anywhere else? You know, only the asylum. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh... Actually, uh, I could tell you with authority. Mm-hmm. The so my wife and I came up with every element of that story one way or another, except for one, mm. which is the uh, birthing sequence at the end. Yeah, uh, that was a an Anthony Ferrante idea. Oh, okay. That uh, yeah. the, the executives loved. We fought against it. <laughs> oh no! Every step of the way. <laughs> 
but they weren't hearing it. So yeah. that's what's in the movie. That's what uh, the big finale of the movie. And mm. uh, I still have mixed feelings. Oh. But uh, uh, it is one that people bring up a lot as, as super fun. So, yeah. you know, who else but Anthony Ferrante would yeah. be able to come up with, with something like that? Love that guy. He's great. Um, but yeah, I guess kind of for we're, we're on the last couple of, you know, last part of the thing here. Any Anything you want to say about Meth Gator to kind of you know, uh, why, you know, when it comes out, when, you know, why people should check it out or anything you're like really excited about or anything. Meth Gator is a movie that should not exist fully. Mm-hmm. Uh, no real studio would make Meth Gator. And that's why you have to watch it so that movies that should not exist like Meth Gator, like Shark Side of the Moon, can continue to exist. End of story. That's well put. I would, yeah, that's that's a good closing statement. <laughs> um, and Liz, I know you're. Uh, I know we're uh, kind of winding down, but um, any any other movies that are coming out that uh, we should look forward to? Like, wanna wanna promote or hype up or anything? I don't know when this is going to be coming out. Okay, uh, but uh, or, we just finished a movie that is super fun that I got to help out with a lot called uh snow white and the seven samurai mm. uh be sure to check that out when yeah. it does come out yeah uh, we've got anything out right now uh right now just released. i mean shark side of the moon shark side of the moon yeah it's on tubi that's tubi original yeah, TV, uh, yeah. megalodon Plug the frenzy please mm-hmm. watch that uh brendan patrizzo fan of the podcast oh yeah he's been on here before he yeah, directed that great. uh so Got to keep that going. And, uh, yeah, is there anything that just came out? This is the problem with developing and making uh, 30 movies a year is, with the, in a department of two is you kind of lose track of yeah, they're all where everything together. is. Yeah. Uh, but we also have... Uh, I uh, wrote some pickups that are in a movie that just came out this past month called Alien Apocalypse. Oh, okay. Uh, which also has Patrick Laberteau uh, in in a role. Uh, he makes kind of a brief cameo appearance, but he's uh, delightful in that. And I wrote some pickup scenes in that that are action-packed and fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, check that out for yeah. sure. Yeah, we'll be sure to yeah check those out wherever they are. Because, yeah, I love watching Asylum movies. Um, yeah, they're great. I mean, I am a little... like them. Yeah, I am a little biased... You know, it is what it is. But Me too. Yeah. <laughs> pay my bills. Yeah, definitely. Please watch. <laughs> Please do. Keep uh, watching. Don't <laughs> stop watching. Yeah. But where can uh, where can people find you at? I don't know. You want to plug any like social media, things like that? Uh, at the Ryan Ebert, uh, wherever your social medias are found. Yeah. However long Twitter is around. Because uh, I, I enjoy your tweets. You have some great tweets, Thank some you. bangers. That's, so. that's where I uh, <laughs> spend most of my time when yeah. I'm not writing scripts. I'm yeah. writing tweets. Fun place to be if you, if you avoid certain spots. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's nice to be a part of the Twitter apocalypse Yeah, uh, while it's still around. Yeah, same. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, you could find uh, the Waffle Press on uh, uh, we're on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud. Uh, this episode should be out uh, time of this recording uh, within the next week. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, follow us there. But uh, Ryan, just uh, thanks for uh, thanks for being on the show. This was great to finally have you on. I know we've been like kind of messaging back and forth, so this is uh, this is cool. We made it happen, and everyone go see uh, Meth Gator, and uh, of course uh, Shark Side of the Moon too. Only on Tubi. Only on Tubi. There you go. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We've been professionally unprofessional. That's our outro. Beautiful. <laughs>